Okay, that's me on an, in Antarctica with a Russian Aleutian IL-76 in the background, which I've just landed on, together with 96 barrels of kerosene. That was the payload and me. That was a frightening experience. We landed on a blue ice, solid ice runway. Um, but that is another story, not the one I'm going to talk about today. Today, I'm going to talk about a story that begins with a local man, Louis Agassi, um, who was a Swiss naturalist. And he was very keen to understand the shape, what caused the shape of a valley like this, and what caused a rock in Finland to do that, among many, many other things. Now, the prevailing theory of the time in the late 19th century was that that valley was shaped by God. Charles Darwin thought that for a while. And a giant put that there. Okay. What Louis Agassiz said, by looking at places like this, just down the road, Alex Glacier, that it was the action of glaciers that caused that to happen. And fundamentally, those glaciers are no longer there. So once in the past, there was a lot more ice on the planet, carving the landscape, dropping stones on each other. Right? That's the idea. Glacial theory was developed as a consequence. And two people, James Kroll, a self-taught mathematician, worked as a janitor in a uh, Glaswegian museum, and a Serbian mathematician, Milutin Milankovic, came up with the idea of explaining glacial theory, the Ice Age. And that is that the Earth does not orbit around the Sun in a circular way. It orbits in a way that is perfectly predictable with mathematics, but it changes subtly. And as it changes, you get more solar radiation and less solar radiation. And when you have less solar radiation, you get it cold and you get an Ice Age. Stands to reason, right? Pretty straightforward <coughs> idea. No one believed it. The reason that no one believed it is because those changes are teeny, tiny. Wouldn't it be good, right? So both of those people died without their theories being accepted. Wouldn't it be good if we had a time machine and we could go back, say, half a million years, and we could sample the environment every year between 500,000 years ago and today? That would be good. Well, we've got one, and it's called Antarctica. And in the middle of Antarctica is Vostok Station. The ice thickness at Vostok Station is 3,741 3, meters thick. Now, the snow on the surface is like snow you get in the Alps. It's pretty light, and that's because it's got air in it. In the middle of the Antarctic ice sheet, the, the flow of ice is only downwards. There's no sideways movement. And so your snowball that you create on the surface, you come back next year and it's been buried, and then buried again, and buried again. So the deeper down you go, the older you get. And at the bottom of the ice sheet, it's half a million years old. That ice has still got the air in it around its time of formation, i.e. it's got bits of air, air bubbles, from half a million years ago. You can drill it out. This is the Vostok ice core, wonderful thing. And when you do the analysis of the carbon dioxide content in that air, from half a million years ago, every single year to the present day, you see you get an unmistakable signature of uh, warm periods, 280 parts per mil, remember that number? 180 or so parts per mil, you get an ice age when it's 180, you get an interglacial between ice ages when it's 280, and that is the periodicity, that is a natural periodicity of our planet, right? It's not ice, uh, it's not the orbital variation that's causing it, but the orbital variation is pacing it. So Milankovic and James Cole were right, but what they didn't understand was that these small changes have big effects feedback processes, which causes carbon dioxide variations in the atmosphere, and it's CO2 that causes the temperature changes that we see between ice ages and interglacials. It's amazing. A bit of natural variability here. So that's what we've got. No carbon dioxide for centuries, thousands of years, above, above 300, until we get to the industrial age. And that's where it is at the moment, way outside that natural envelope. That is the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere. Now, you can talk about uh, how much the temperature has changed. This is the so-called hockey stick, ice hockey stick for anyone who's British uh, here. Uh, and it goes the last thousand years or so. It's going down, 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 gradually getting cooler, gradually getting cooler. There's quite a bit of variation, but that's the signal, until you get to the Industrial Revolution, and then it kicks up here. That's the air temperature. You plot air temperature and carbon dioxide 
above them, each other, and this is what you get. Air temperature doing this, carbon dioxide doing this. Unmistakable fit that the world is warming as a consequence of uh, carbon dioxide concentration. It's very difficult to see how you get climate change skeptics when you see this type of information. And it's still going up. It's over 400 parts per mil. This is the Mauna Loa uh, Observatory in Hawaii. This variation is what happens every single year. The northern hemisphere grows a load of trees, carbon dioxide gets drawn down, and then those die, carbon dioxide goes back up again, natural, and it's still going up and up and up. This is our scorecard. How well are we doing on the battle with climate change? This is the scorecard. You know, there's a lot of renewables and things like that going on, it's all good progress, but this number is still going upwards, and that's what we need to, to care about. And um, we are caring about it. There is a lot of international understanding about what we have to do uh, to stop carbon dioxide. And we always talk about carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas, but it's an important one, and it's important for this reason. This is quite a complicated curve, but look at the red line. The red line is the one we're on at the moment. That is, we are, don't care too much about it, and carbon dioxide levels are still going up. If they keep going up and up and up, say for um, another couple of hundred years, and we suddenly realize, oh, we've cooked the planet, let's switch it off, and we do switch it off, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere stays for centuries more. That's 3,000 years. CO2 hangs about in the atmosphere. That's the problem. It's not a problem just for ourselves. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more problem it will be for future generations. Can't get rid of it. And when the temperature goes up, the ice melts. Sad polar bears. So let's do a little straw poll around here. Who can tell me what they think that uh, all the ice around the world, if all the ice melted, how much would the sea level go up? Seven feet. Hang on, you said seven feet. Hands, who put your hand up? Seven feet. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm not saying it's incorrect. I've been ten meters. Ten meters. I said 220. Right, all right. So we've got a big, wide variety, right? And this is quite an important thing because this is our planet, right? And I'm asking you, very clever people, to understand about how much ice is there on our planet that if it all melts, sea level. It's not a very difficult question, but it's surprising, right, that the answer is. Oops. 66 meters. That's how much ice there is. If it all melts, sea level goes up to 60 meters. Next question. 300,000 glaciers all around the world. Right, glacier is one of them. Not talking about Antarctica, not talking about Greenland. Just those 300,000. If they all melt, how much does the sea level go up? Come on. Come on. It's after lunch. So, uh, five, 0.5 meters, 50 centimeters. Right? That's why polar scientists care about Antarctica, right? and that's why we care about Greenland. They are by far the largest store. If these things melt and change, the sea level really, really matters. The other glaciers, well, they can contribute as well, but they're barometers of change rather than major impacts of the global environment. All right, let's keep going. The ice age was 20,000 years ago. I'm giving you that one. Right? But how much was sea level lower 20,000 years ago than it is today? Because the ice came from the ocean. It was precipitated on the land, it froze, the ice sheets built up, and the sea level went down. But by how much? You've got 120 meters? 50. 500. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, we will call it 130, right? But that's the ballpark. That means that since the Ice Age, because of carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere, the ice melted and sea level went up by 130 meters. So should we be worried about sea level now because the carbon dioxide level is higher than it has been for some time, the ice might melt. Well, of course we should. Of course we should. That's what happens if all the ice goes in London. The top of Big Ben becomes a sort of lovely <laughs> harbour for uh, posh boats and things in London. Anyway, you got the idea. Now, I'm not going to talk about sea ice. This is the sea ice floating on the, ice, uh, on the surface of the ocean. It doesn't contribute to um, uh, sea level because it's already displaced its weight in water. But just to say that sea ice in the Arctic is going at an amazing rate as well. The model predictions of sea ice declining over the next 100 years have been far outpaced by observations of sea ice declining. Our best methods of, of predicting how sea ice would go have been outpaced by the observations. But I'm a glaciologist. I like to fly planes like that. That is a Basler BT-76, used to be a DC-3, 1942 DC-3, beautiful aircraft on skis. That's radar, either side of the wings, and we fly it around Antarctica. Beautiful pictures like that. That's the Ellsworth Mountains. Peaks of the mountains. Just Switzerland was once like this. This really was uh, the Ice Age. Um, and I try to unpeel the ice uh, that's around here. I try to look underneath it. 
and we try to measure the volume of that ice as well. And this is some data. These are mountains underneath two or three kilometers of ice. That's the sort of thing that I do. And if you take it all away, that's what Antarctica looks like. Beautiful. It's like, it's like a space image, really. It's a beautiful landscape hidden under all that ice. But it's important to understand that as well. So let's go back to the questions. When was the last time in Earth's history we had 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? When? I want to say never. When was, the, when was the last time? Oh, blimey. That is going back 220 million years. Right? That's not quite. So we've got to go back. The Pliocene, 5 million years. And the Pliocene, whoops, that's what Antarctica looked like. It was bits of it missing. Sea level was 15 meters higher then than it was now. So if you regard carbon dioxide as being the temperature control on your oven, say, when you switch your oven on to 200 degrees centigrade, it doesn't instantly get to that, right? But the, the energy supply going in means that it will get there eventually, and that is like carbon dioxide. Once the CO2 level is turned up, it's like a thermometer, thermostat on, on, on your atmosphere. We are going to get to the Pliocene. Now, it might take some hundreds of years, but it's inevitable we will get there, and sea level is going to go up. When was the last time we had a thousand? If we don't do anything about carbon dioxide, we just say, ah, oh, to hell with that. I don't believe a word you're saying. We're just going to keep burning fossil fuels uh, because it suits us, right? By the end of this century, we'll have a thousand parts per mil. When was the last time that happened? <laughs> it's not the Jurassic, but it's, look, it's close. It's the, Creta the Cretaceous. And in the Cretaceous, there were dinosaurs, and there was no ice in Antarctica at all. No ice anywhere on the planet. So, again, that's what we, no, it might take somehow, it might take 10,000 years, it might take longer than that. But that is the inevitable destination of an atmosphere with 1,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide uh, in it. And it's changing now, we can see it. This is the cryosat image of Antarctic ice sheet surface change. The grey bits is where it's not changing too much, but the red bits is where it's going by more, more than a metre a year for the last few years. And there are bits around the edge of Antarctica, where we're starting to see that. Antarctica is losing mass. This is beautiful Westminster Abbey in London. And I'm showing you this because it's got these things called flying buttresses. The, this medieval building is too high to su support itself mechanically. And if you didn't have the buttresses, it would fall down. And the ice sheet is just like that as well. Around it are these floating areas, very thick ice, 300, 400 meters thick ice. And if they go, they support the flow of ice, grounded ice, into the ocean. If the ice shelves go, the grounded ice gets more vulnerable to change. You don't have to melt it, you just have to flow it into the ocean, and the sea level happens, because it's Archimedes' principle. So, are these ice shelves vulnerable? Well, yes, they are. We're starting to see things like this, which is surface runoff of the, um, this is the Nansen uh, ice shelf in East Antarctica. This was taken a couple of years ago, and it astonished glaciologists. We've never seen this before. A particularly warm year, but if that's going to happen in the future, you know, we can say goodbye to the, the buttressing support of the ice in Antarctica and say a, hello to a lot more uh, sea level change. So is sea level change happening now? Is it going up? It certainly is. Uh, in the middle latter part of the 19th century, it was going up at 0.8 millimeters per year, just after the Industrial Revolution. Middle part of the 20th century, two millimeters per year, and now it's going at 3.2 millimeters per year. Sea level is going up right now, and the rate of change is also going up because of the melting of glaciers. And unfortunately, it's not a very um, fair uh, thing. Glaciers, these big ice sheets, Antarctica and Greenland, are so massive, they have a gravitational attraction. So the strange thing is, if you melt the Greenland ice sheet, or you melt the Antarctic ice sheet, right next to it, bizarrely, sea level goes down, because the gravitational attraction is reduced. And if you're far away, however, you don't see that effect at all. So in the low-lying Pacific nations, in the middle part of the, of, the, of the world, you get the full effect from both Greenland and Antarctica. That's why it's an unfair system. A metre of sea level, we could easily get a metre this century. This century, by the end of this century, we could have sea level a metre higher than it is now. That's quite plausible. And we've got serious problems in northwest um, Europe as a consequence of just one metre. Massive um, uh, investments are going to be needed to protect the land, if indeed it is protectable. So what can we do? Well, it's about carbon dioxide reductions. It's about the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. And it's about us all uh, working well. The, the pathway we're on at the moment is this one over here, no mitigation. Paris climate deal is this one over here. It's not enough. This is the one that we need to be on. We need a zero carbon economy by 2100. We are not on that pathway. But it's the next few years that are critical to determining 
which pathway we get on. At the moment, we're on this one, but there's time to change. But the further on in time you go, the more difficult it is to switch pathways. That's why action now is so critical, so important. Now, I'm a glaciologist, and I want to tell you about the ice sheets, but it's not just about the ice. There's other things. At the Grantham Institute and Imperial College, we've been working on what happens to other parts of the Earth system with global warming. Under these three scenarios, no mitigation, 5.2 degrees centigrade warmer at the end of this century, we've got a lot more heat waves coming. If we do the INDCs from the Paris Climate Deal, it's not bad, but if we really work hard and, and all the pledges and more, we can actually start to reduce these impacts. But not negligible, there is still some. There are some unavoidable consequences of what we've already done to our planet. We just need to reduce those as much as we possibly can. Same with cropland decline. This is a worse story. I mean, serious issues if we don't uh, um, mitigate anything. But even if we do our best, we've got real problems being able to feed ourselves. Same comes with flooding. Floods are going to be uh, more important. You know, I was in Houston when, when Storm Harvey hit. This is downtown Houston. It's a terrible thing. And water. We are using far too much water on our planet. Aquifers beneath the surface have been charged over thousands of years, and we've taken a few decades to take most of it out. So we've got real problems having the water available to, to um, uh, keep the crops wet that we need to allow them to grow. So this is put it all together. This is the problem that we're facing. We've got a critical moment in our, in our world. We're the first generation that knows climate change is happening, that knows that we are responsible for it, and knows that we have to act right now. Because the longer we leave it, the more expensive it's going to be, and the more difficult it's going to be to do that. We also know that we can do it as well. So I'll leave you, finally, with a nice picture of Antarctica, and happy to take your questions. Thank you.